to see you guys again. Um, last time we talked about different ways that you can guide your students through the reading that you have them do with the informational text, often complex informational text that you use for your classes. Um, raise your hand if you were able to use any of those strategies. Some of us good. Uh, any graphic organizers? Anyone use those? Uh, does anyone use any vocabulary activities? Good. Uh, zoom in on that for students. Um, any type of discussion activities where kids are actually talking about their reading? That's going to be very important. And you probably do that a lot. And that is going to be part of what we're talking about today as well. We're moving to the next session, this session, um, in support of your uh, literacy goals. We're talking about text-dependent questions. And we talked about this last spring when we referred to close reading strategies. Part of doing close reading strategies is creating questions that force students to utilize the text to support their answers. Um, that's what's lacking often with students. They kind of give an answer and they don't back it up. So our answer is always prove it, back it up. So these questions kind of force them into that habit of doing that. Not only in just answering questions on paper, not only in answering questions verbally, but also in their writing as well uh, to support what they do, what they're talking about, what they're trying to convey. So basically when we talk about text-dependent questions, we're talking about different tiers of questions that have students focus on, questions that have students focus on really what the text says, how it says it, and what it actually means. It means to something bigger and better. And often when we go through this strategy, it's for something you want to consider when you're going through the steps. You don't do this for every section of your book. So, and sometimes you don't even have kids read every section of the book. I know that too. So for, for sections that you do, and we're talking about small sections, not an entire chapter. For sections that you do have them read, that part, um, you want it to be something that is probably more complex, something that they can't do independently. Um, but you really need them to grasp this information for something bigger that's going to be happening, some type of culminating activity, um, even to prepare them for your lab setting in your class. But the idea is that we want them to focus in on specific structures of this text to help them better comprehend. So when we look at the different types of questions, as I mentioned, there are the three tiers. There are three tiers. So these are divided up into tier one, these two are tier two, and the top tier are tier three. So we talk about tier one questions. We're really looking at questions that have a focus on the key ideas and details, the main idea. They're sort of like a warm-up question. Um, they force the students to use the text to answer, but there are low-level blooms types of questions that just get them, again, like I said, to kind of warm up and really think about, well, what does this say? What, what does this actually mean? So the other component to this first tier question, the general understandings and key details, is that the students are really just having to look at maybe a words or a sentence. It's not spanning the whole uh, passage that you're asking to cover. It's usually just, you know, one section that they'll be able to just go in and find it. So those are considered text-dependent questions, but they're also called right-there questions. And right-there questions don't really require a lot of searching, a lot of thinking. You're just kind of getting them you know, to get the point out of that. Uh, those are the, that's why they're considered first-tier low-level questions, those right-there questions. The next set of questions pertain to how the text is structured. So you're kind of having them look in on headings, subheadings. Are there objectives in the margins? Are there certain words that are bolded for a reason? Um, any charts, maps, diagrams, <coughs> graphs? Um, any sorts of uh, language that's used uh, that's special to that section? And also, most importantly, with respect to you guys, is the vocabulary, the terminology. We talked last time the importance of vocabulary, especially with what you do, that kids are going into the field with this content behind them. They need to be using the verbiage. Uh, the language that is part of it as well. So having zone in on that. And then also author's purpose. And that you're going to be focusing on not so much on the informational text, because that sort of has one tone to it and not bias typically. But when you pull in some articles 
from your uh, professional journals that you guys order, or from the internet that you might pull off, or from videos that you might show. That's where you're going to have them cue in on what is the author really trying to, uh, to convey, and why, what size are we looking at. And in that, in that set, second tier set of questions, the students are going to be looking across paragraphs and larger segments. Okay, so here they're diving and having to dive in a little deeper for the second tier set of questions. The third tier set of questions are the highest on Bloom's taxonomy, and that's where we're asking the students to make opinions and arguments and inferences. And what we're having them do here is look across the entire text, but also across multiple texts. So we're not asking them now, we're asking them to kind of pull together all of their information and actually synthesize. And synthesizing is taking what they know, what they're learning, and pulling it into some newer understanding based on, on what they knew and now know something bigger. And that's what we're asking them to do. They're synthesizing at this point. And when they synthesize, like I said, they're looking across the entire text, but we want to pull in the videos that you're having them watch, the articles that you're having them read, anything from online that you're having them read, and now they're, they're having to tie all of this together. So we're going to look at a video in a little bit that kind of exemplifies that and how that could work. All right, so basically just to sum up, we're looking at first read, uh, for, and when we talk about first read, remember the close reading, this doesn't typically happen. These questions don't get answered when the kids just read it once and are done. You're asking them to go in and read again in greater detail and greater purpose each time. Sometimes you might read it to them in between there in the close reading strategy, um, but other times they're reading independently. Um, so basically you're asking them to find out uh, the key ideas and details for the first set of questions, the second set of questions is author's craft and structure, and then that third set is the integration of the knowledge of ideas and ideas from across the board. So the other component to this, as I mentioned before, is in between each of these sets of questions, not only are they reading and answering, they also have to discuss. They have to be pulling from their heads what their understanding is and be able to articulate it and sometimes debate it with other students. That's really the key to elevating this and getting them to understand it on a much deeper level. That's what we're trying to get. So in a close reading strategy, as I mentioned, this is a poster, you can print it out, put it in the room. It's what it says, how it says, and what it actually means. So for the first read, it's they read it on their own to get that kind of mental conflict. I understand, I don't. They can annotate, as we talked about last time, with guided, read, guided reading strategies. Um, then they answer that first level question set independently, and then you give them time to talk about it. They read it pairs or in teams, and then pull it to the whole group. Then reading it again, either for the teacher or um, students or independently. Second tier question set, independently, and then getting them to talk about it. And then you get to the third read, independently, and then getting to the third set of questions. And again, this is not for an entire chapter, but for a smaller segment. And you really need them to walk away with something that they're going to take to something else. There's always something, this is always in pursuit of something bigger. Um, now let me show you an example of that. Um, it's going to be examples of a shared reading. It's going to be examples of um, students answering, of annotating, students answering questions, students talking about those questions in teams, and then using that in the pursuit of a bigger project, some culminating activity. That's all part of what text dependent questions lead to. This, I'm going to show you a middle school example, uh, but it's with an informational text. Um, it's on uh, child labor laws. But the idea, and because it's a middle school setting, and because it's a different subject area than you might teach, you're going to have to step away from looking at this literally and really be, think about how you would apply these strategies to your class. Okay? Let's see. I had some trouble with video last time. And watch all the different Common Core standards that are covered in this multi-standard rich lesson.
it's too well then. Yeah, all the volumes are up. You can hear it. You can hear it back there. It's kind of faint. All right, you can just try to listen as best you can. support. Accountability from every member on the team. So she's talking about those high tier questions. Asking them again to pull across multiple texts and videos. Show that person doing that for me, okay? Remember when we're citing or we're 
So the idea is to think about this sort of approach, this strategy, how is this something that you could actually implement in your own classes? Um, you have blocks, you have two hour blocks, um, yet often most of that is for the lab setting, uh, the shop setting that they have come to do, or the practical application. But we still have the responsibility to teach the students. So sometimes what we've done is we lecture. And we might spend like 30, 40 minutes, part of that two hour block is your lecture time. So the idea now is to think, how can I modify that to incorporate some of these literacy standards from the Common Core that you are now responsible for? But how can you do that without taking up additional time? So instead of adding on to a lecture, modify. Instead of lecturing for the entire time, do a mini lesson. We call them mini. I think I mentioned this before. We call them mini because kids typically only have the attention span for as long as they are in age. So if you have 16 year olds, you've got about 16 minutes with them to talk. So you want to mix in, after that, you want to mix in independent reading with first level questions, discussing, second level questions, discussing, third level questions, discussing. That is going to get them to a level of understanding um, often better than just from us being able to give them the information or even sometimes what we do is, and I used to do this a lot, um, the text was difficult or maybe boring, so I watered it down with PowerPoints, and I just I gave PowerPoints as my instruction. But that ended up being a disservice to them. I did that all the time because I'm not giving them the opportunity to actually learn the process of learning for themselves, holding them accountable for their own learning. So that's why we want to we can guide them through that if the text is too hard with the guiding reading activities from last time and this set of questions, these question sets, different tiers, are actually additional scaffolds and hand-holding for the students as well. To guide them. <coughs> so that's what we want to think about. How can we modify what we already do instead of thinking of it as something we have to add on, something extra? It's really not. Uh, because your goal is to set these kids off, whether it's career or college, to be able to be independent and learn for themselves. Because as when school ends, testing, certification, that doesn't end. Having to read manuals, uh, all industries are changing constantly because of technology. They're constantly getting something thrown, will, will be, getting something new thrown at them for them to have to figure out on their own, whether it be from a video, a how-to video, or whether it be from a manual that's mailed to them. Um, I have to go to Seattle for training this, uh, this weekend, and I have to actually perform and be able to get to a certain level in order to do certain trainings. So it never ends. 45 and it never ends. Same for these kids. Like I said, whether they go to college or they go right into the career. They are constantly going to be tested, so we need to give them those tools to be able to be independent. And that's exactly what these are doing. So the idea is to make sure that we are giving them that tech support. Um, we are giving them the support for them to constantly be providing evidence with their answers. Back it up constantly. So that's, I just want you to think about not adding on, don't think of it as adding on, but think about it in terms of how can I modify to still be able to prepare them. So these are the steps when you're doing these uh, text-dependent questions. I'm leave here to this stuff. Um, think about what the most important learning is. When you're going through the set of questions, you want to make sure that it's something that is going to be leading to something bigger. Um, think about the key ideas of the text the powerful words that you want them to be able to use in their everyday language um, with this career goal that they have. Make sure that you're covering different standards with respect to uh, your own content area and literacy as well. Um, but of course, the literacy is built in when you're doing these. Um, any other academic words, um, pick out the sections with greatest difficulty, as I mentioned. And again, number seven is very important. Develop some sort of culminating activity. So what are they going to do? In that last video, they had to do, I think it was a newspaper article. So they were taking that information that they were coming, that they were learning about, they were coming to consensus on routine discussion, and bringing it to um, some sort of writing assignment. Um, I have a list here. And next month, we're going to be talking specifically about writing activities. Um, but right here, I have a list of different culminating activities. This is from the PARC website, 
And what it does is saying, all right, well, these are different things that the kids should be doing as writing activities, and they could be tested on these samples on par. Uh, the first set is going to be uh, the different writing activities that grades three through five would should be incorporating. And then there's a smaller list for grades six through eight, but that is only in addition to the three through five. And then the high school examples are not just those high school examples, but these three through five examples in addition to the six through eight examples. So there are lots of different lots of different ways you can incorporate writing that make it authentic and easy ways for students to be incorporating their understandings and their terminology. So what would be some that would be pertinent to what you do? Um, what's that? Book reviews. Book reviews, okay. Magazine articles. Yeah. Yeah, so that that is in <coughs> what's that? Letters. Writing letters. To yes, in fact, who, who was it? The, I think it was, I can't remember, I think it was from Tom's River. Uh, the dental hygienist teacher, I think, is what she taught. She said that she did, remember we talked about using vocabulary words in either a story or a letter. She said she saw a much better understanding from them of those terms than if she had to do, if she had to do a fill in the blank or a multiple choice or true false. She said she really got them to see not only what the words meant, but also the connection between those words. And that's the idea. We want to see kids plugging it in and applying and a news article, a how-to article. These are specific examples of how you can actually use these. Persuasive letter, absolutely. Pamphlet, definitely. Right, what else? Speeches, public speaking. Yes. Can we use technical bulletins? Because like in my trade, we yes. do technical bulletins, <coughs> calls and updates. Yes, that's exactly what you would want to do. That's part of this, this authentic writing. Because we don't want it to be something that is not real world based, we want it to be something that fits right in and makes sense. So this is just one list, here's another. But I think actually this is the best list. And then so high school kids would have that list. They could come from this list. Um, anecdotes, apologies, complaints, that would actually be good. Editorials, interviews. And then satire, spoofs, and testimonies. Right? So you can come up with some really great ways to take what they're learning and apply it to something that's authentic with a writing um, approach. All right, so I love this list, and I like it also because it comes from Park, so we know that it's something that um, those who are tested, who are going to be tested, are going to be, we're going to be helping with that. Jamie, can I ask, how yes. long, do you know how long the um, English literacy testing will take for the students this year at Park? I don't think they modify that. I know that through the, um, pilots that they did. Mm -hmm. They had, I think it was 70 minutes for certain portions, and I know that kids finished like that, but that could be, sometimes they did, but that could be for different reasons. That could be because kids knew that they were taking a test that wasn't gonna count. That could be because they did overestimate the time <coughs> that it was going to take to do it. So at this point, we don't know like the timings of everything. Uh, that's something that they're still trying to uh, to revamp based on what they learned from the pilots. Because when I looked online, it said nine and a half hours to assess. Oh, yeah, I at this point I think that there's definitely so, because they did overestimate before. Mm -hmm. So and plus I don't know if that does that take into consideration like the two different times that might be on the two different because originally when Park was created mm -hmm. it was a good idea it was created so that we would not only be using it as a summative assessment right because right? now we've got a test at the end of the year and we don't get the results back till summer and then those kids we don't have anymore the idea was to test them four times in a year so that we can actually use it as formative assessment so we can see what they did and what we can now do to drive our instruction better. But then they realize that's not really realistic, having four, being tested four times, um, so they narrowed it down to two. Um, but still the timing I think is a little off, it's like March and some of the time I remember. So um, that I think they're still kind of revamped. That might be the total of the two mm -hmm. times, yeah. So now this, let's see if this is worth it now. This is just a little template um, that kind of gets you thinking, all right, first read question, I'm gonna ask a kind of question, this isn't the actual question, but a kind of question that asks what's going on and how do I know? For a second read question, I'm going to ask how do authors' choices in language and craft help me understand something I didn't know? And then a third read question, you're gonna ask a type of question that is like, what does this text uh, cause me to think or wonder about something bigger? This is a 
really nice tool. I don't have this one printed out, but you can, the, the website is right here. You can, click, you can actually click on the image and it takes you right there, but I like this. Um, basically what it is, is it helps you to figure out what level of question that you are creating. So basically what it says is create questions by using one word from the left hand column and one word from the top row. The further down and to the right you go, the more complex and high level question is. So a who is question is the lowest level on this matrix, while a why might would be your highest level. So this, yes, yeah, so this is a really, really nice tool. Yeah. So this is something you just kind of like keep in your plan book or keep wherever. Do we have plan books on the books anymore? I don't know if you guys use that. If you use uh, on course or whatever. But keep it somewhere. When you're planning, this is really a nice tool to use. Um, another tool, oh, another, this is another question set of question prompts that you can use when you create your questions. There is also a link right here. Oh, the link is ready to copy and paste. I'll fix it. But anyway, that's the link if you want to go and print it out. Uh, or you can print out these two slides. But basically, it just gives you a bunch of different ideas for how to write questions that are text dependent. Now remember, we have the first tier questions. I said that typically sometimes those are just right there questions. We want them to still have a little bit of value to them, so we usually span across not just a word, but a sentence. But remember those high level questions? We still, sometimes we'll say, what would you do if you blah, blah, blah? That's a really, that's a good high level question. We're asking them to make an application and sometimes synthesize and evaluate. However, we're asking them to leave the text that is not, that answer is not dependent on what the text is giving them. So that's not considered a text dependent question. Well, it might be a high question that you can use, but when you're trying to do text dependent questions, that one is not. So remember, all the questions that you create should be forcing them to back it up with evidence from the text. Prove it, prove it, prove it. So these are different prompts that are really nice to use. And then this is what we're going to use now with our text. Sometimes the questions in our text are great. Sometimes, like the drawing conclusions questions, sometimes those are um, you know, high level, as I said, but they're a little too lofty on Blooms, and they actually have the kids leave the text and not use it. So these are questions, these are a little, this is a little checklist for you to use when you are creating uh, questions. So the first set, <coughs> um, the first set, you either keep them or dump them. So there's just two. And it says these things must be true of every question in the set. When evaluating questions, discard all questions that get a no in this section A. So the first section says, does the student have to read the text to answer each question? All right, that's easy. And then the second one is, is it always clear to students that answering each question requires that they must use evidence from the text to support their claims? So once you kind of get a handle on what this whole set is asking, the second set of questions are about uh, considerations. These are design factors to keep in mind for the entire question set. The D level um, on the checklist our organization of the questions. So do the early questions in the sequence focus on specific phrases and sentences. Um, remember we did the lower tier ones. Uh, to support basic comprehension of the text and develop student conference before moving on to one. Uh, moving on to more challenging tasks, first tier, second tier, third tier. And then the, the fifth section is about the culminating activity or writing project. Does the culminating task call on the knowledge understanding acquired through the questions? Does the writing prompt in the culminating task demand that students write to the text and use evidence? Are the instructions to teacher and student clear about what must be performed to achieve proficiency? And that, you know, it's kind of like common sense, but sometimes um, I'll make up, you know, some type of um, activity, and in my mind, I think it's understood, and I may not express everything that needs to be done, but it kind of, it, it's, not, um, it's not innate for certain students and they need it spelled out for them. Um, or everyone does because I wasn't clear. So that's what that question is asking. And then is this a task worthy of the student and classroom time to will consume? And that's exactly the point I was trying to make before. We want to make it authentic. You don't, this is not, these literacy goals are not added for you to make extra work. These are added uh, for you to layer 
and which will we do? And to make sure that you are preparing them, as I said, to be independent learners. Um, but you want to make sure that it's going to fit right in in an authentic way to what you already do. So what I wanted to do is take a look at the questions in your text, because sometimes there's a great text of any questions, and sometimes they're not. So let's look at, you know, at the end of a section, a set of questions, and see how they rank on this checklist. You can pair up with someone in your content area um, and see how it goes. Let's see if they do it. I'll come around and help. Can everyone get one? Does everyone see one of these, please? If you did not bring your text, then if you can pair up with someone in your content area, if you don't have that with someone who's not in your content area, just to get the idea. So that everyone is referring to your text. Listen a lot, I need to talk to everybody. But what we noticed is that some of the texts have actually great examples of the three tiers of questions. And there are others that, did you see that in your mind? That's good. Others were really just the, right there, the first level questions. So what we were talking about is just adding on to that second tier type question and third tier type question to make sure that we're, we're asking them to use the text to support their answers. And what we're talking about here is some of the levels of the students uh, and their uh, lack of capability to be independent and even, um, you mentioned, use context clues or be able to really recognize things that are kind of right there. So that's where we have to layer those guiding reading activities from last month, along with these three tiers of questions. Um, but there are other prompts that you can use. If you look at those prompts that I had on the slide, use those. But then also asking them again and again, what part of the text supports your answer? Where in the text can you, sh can you ex uh, help to explain why this might happen? What page, what section? So actually forcing them not just what explains it for you or proves it for you, but where in the text. Show it, find it. And that's where you can have, and that's where you're actually forcing them to find where these are. In some texts we are saying, actually the questions kind of go in the order of the text, that might be helpful to them. Um, for those, the lower level students who need that, um, but that's what we need to do, yeah. Um, so like basically like with what we would be doing, we have them like page number and paragraph. Yeah, so yeah. That, so that you could. For that, the answer to that question. Yeah, you could, but even better, you can start doing that, but then get them in, into uh, weaving that into their answer. So using like prepositional phrases, like in paragraph three, the author states, that sort of thing, because I mean, that's should be long, right? It Not just should, one sentence. Right, it should be a conversation here. that they're trying to give to you. It should be like, you know, like three to five. Sentences. Yeah, it could be a paragraph. It could be, you know, just one or two sentences. But we want them. Um, you can start out by having them. You notice that they're not. They're really having trouble, you know, figuring out that the answers are in the text and they can prove their answers by using the text. Have them, you know, page and paragraph answer support. Page a paragraph, answer with support, and then get them into, kind of do it as a staff, then get them into um, moving up to, you know, you know, weaving it into a couple sentences or a paragraph, um, if needed for that question. Uh, but the idea is, I was talking to another group where they were saying, we have one day of instruction and it's all hands on. So that's what you want to do is look at that day of instruction, how you can mix that up between lecture, between reading, maybe put a video in there. Maybe have independent um, answering, then have them work together in pairs or teams to discuss their answers, then pull it together as a whole group. You want to mix up your that instruction time to make it um, include multi-standards, but more importantly, you want to have multiple instructional strategies to reach all the different learners and to be able to accommodate not only the standards that you're responsible for in your own content area, but also the literacy standards that you are also responsible for as per Common Core. Um, and by the way, I mean, have you guys actually seen the Common Core website and seen what those standards are? The website is great, but I really love the app. I have the app on my phone. Um, for you guys, I'm just going to, you do the same thing on the website, go to standards. And when we talk about writing next time, I'll make sure I have that link to the standards um, in your, in the presentation I give you. So I'm gonna go to, yours is science and technical subjects. That's who you guys are, science and technical subjects. Then I'm gonna go to, these are six through eight, nine through 10, 10 or 11 through 12, I'll go through 11 through 12. There is a reading section for these standards, a writing section, and that's it. 
But the idea and now are all together 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. There are about 20 different standards. But you need to remember that, remember that one lesson? There were about eight different standards in one lesson. So these are going to be light. It's not like, and the idea is that I know you guys have goals of one lesson per month, I think it is, or something. Is that what it is? Or one letter C? One writing. Right, okay, one writing. Text dependent writing. Okay. But the idea is that, yeah, we're talking about text dependent writing, that's going to be something much so longer. Want more right. More. These right. are just simple questions, but you're talking to about do the in between, writing. right? Yeah, yeah. But the idea is that, you know, we, we don't want to think of it as a requirement we have to do. Think of it as something that's going to not only help the students when they leave us and go into the real world or the college, but, more, but also it's helping you with your instruction. You know, sometimes, sometimes you get frustrated because they're not able to do this, this, and this, and this. These are going to help them do that. So it's going to be less frustrating for you in the long run. But the idea is to embed these on a regular basis so that it becomes mastery and not just something that you have to do. Um, because like I said, and if you look at these, you're already doing most of them anyway, in different ways. So now, again, don't think of it as something isolated and extra, above and beyond, just think about how you can modify what you're already doing to easily incorporate those. That's the best way to look at it. Yes? I have a little silly question. For the app, is it green and black? It's green and black, yes. It's little black yes. dots, okay. Yes, I love it. Uh, the website's great, but I just, I love the app. It's so much easier. But for you guys, really, you only have that one section. So, I mean, I'll just take you to that specific link, and then you guys can print them and have them. <laughs> but that's this year. Yes. Yeah. 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 And you can get and learn more about it. But then there is a little, on the top left-hand corner, there's a little comment section. You can type in what activities you would be doing or have done in order to fulfill that standard. So it's a little interactive tool for you to put in your own comments and ideas. OK? Are you excited too? Huh? <laughs> That's it. So try to practice using some of these. Um, strategies with text dependent questions, continuing to add on with the guiding reading activities, keep doing some of those, and then next month we'll talk about different writing activities and maybe ways that we can incorporate technology with that as well since that's a good motivator for us. And those yellow ones you can put right over there on your way out.